Welcome everyone to the Energy and Environment Sustainability Group David Mackay Memorial Lecture, which takes place every year in December. I'm the chair of EESG Rupert Blackstone, and I'm delighted to introduce Mike Hensley to give our, our talk tonight um, on the, the sixth carbon budget, an overview of the sixth carbon budget the pathway to net zero emissions in the UK by 2050. Mike Hemsley leads the CCC's Carbon Budgets team, bringing together the CCC's analysis on sectoral emissions and leading work on cross-cutting decarbonisation policy. He previously led the CCC's work on power sector decarbonisation, having joined the Committee on Climate Change six years ago. He has focused on technologies and policies to reduce emissions in the UK power system and technologies for low carbon hydrogen production as well as improving electricity system flexibility and producing research on the costs of low carbon policies on consumer bills in the UK. Prior to joining the CCC, Mike studied environmental technology and energy policy at Imperial College London and worked in Brussels at the European Renewable Energy Council. You can answer, uh, ask questions throughout the presentation uh, on the box to the right of your screen and then we'll pick up as many of those as we can at the end. Uh, presentation runs for just under three quarters of an hour so we'll have about um, just over 10 minutes at the end to answer questions and with that I'll pass you on to Mike for the presentation. Hello, great to be with you, you here this afternoon to talk you through our latest work on the UK sixth carbon budget which covers the period of 2033 to 2037. We're actually saying that this is the path to the UK's net zero target, which was legislated into law last year. Just to introduce myself, I'm Mike Hensley. I'm a team leader at the Committee on Climate Change, uh, where I work on the UK's carbon budgets. Uh, we're, we're an independent government ad advisor uh, who advises the government on, on what the level of future targets should be, but also on how to meet them. And, and we're going to talk through some of that content today. Uh, I've, I've been at the CCC for about seven years now. Um, and I'm really pleased to get to this point, especially um, for the sixth carbon budget after putting in probably a quite an intense last 18 months of work to get here. So we're all really excited to, to, to be sharing these, uh, these findings and conclusions with you all today. We've got plenty to, to talk about um, in this presentation, so I'll get straight to it. But just uh, an overview of the things I'd like to cover here. So one, I just want to give you an understanding of, of how we actually do the do the analysis and what we've done this year. Then, of course, we'll move on to the headline budget recommendations. Then we'll talk about um, at, actually what it means to deliver these emissions reductions overall. Then we'll recap on some of the detail of what we're calling our balanced pathways. This is our recommended pathway on how to meet the budget. There we'll cover implications for energy, uh, carbon capture and storage and infrastructure, things like that. Then, then we'll look at um, some of the policy and priorities that we that we think need to get going from the government, um, including their own to-do list. Some of the overall impacts this is likely to have as well in terms of costs, savings, and um, but also benefits, and, and and then also look at the look at the jobs front as well. And and lastly, we'll, we'll just cover why we think this is a fair and ambitious contribution to the Paris Agreement, which which we do think it is. Great. So move, moving on to the first part of those, then let's let's cover um, our approach this year. So. Some of you might remember that back in May 2019, we published a report um, advising the UK government that, that net zero emissions was possible in the UK by 2050. Um, and we think it's, that the UK government should change the long term target to meet that. But in order to, to be comfortable giving that advice to government, we did a kind of a quite a quick six months of analysis uh, looking at a snapshot world of 2050 and saying, well, do we think we can get emissions low enough to net zero in 2050? But we just looked at the year 2050. We didn't actually look at the pathway in between. We, we, we obviously gave ourselves some confidence in what the pathway might look like, but we didn't produce all the detail behind that. What we're doing this year is basically doing that pathway as well. So we, we're doing the same kind of analysis that we did 18 months ago, but we're doing it for every year between now and 2050 to give us much more confidence in the pathway to how, on how to meet that that. Uh, 2050 target for the UK. Also, what we're doing is we're producing more variants on that pathway as well to give us kind of a, a, a wider breadth of understanding of the possibilities on how on how to get to the UK's net zero target. Um, 
and that all of that in, informs our recommended pathway as well. So, so just let me talk you through the, the different variants of uh, what we're calling exploratory pathways that, that we've looked at this year. So first of all, I, I mentioned last year, we just looked at a snapshot for 2050, so just, just emissions in the year 2050. That we thought it was important to translate that into a detailed pathway. So that's what we're calling headwinds. That's the most aligned to what we published in 2019. That's the headwind scenario. Then we're looking at two key variants of that. One we're called it, calling widespread engagement. This is a scenario where you see much greater behavior change. Uh, this is behavior change in the uptake of low carbon technologies, but also the uptake of low carbon behaviors, such as diet change or changing attitudes to flying. And both of those have an impact on emissions. The other variant we're then looking at is uh, called widespread innovation. We're typically quite conservative in, in the, what we project for the future in terms of costs and efficiencies of technologies. In this scenario, we really wanted to test that and say, for example, last year we, we suggested that wind, offshore wind might continue to cost in the order of 50 pounds a megawatt hour by 2050. This year, in this scenario, we just said, well, what if, what if it's 20 pounds a megawatt hour instead? What if costs more than half between now and 2050? What does that do? What, what does that actually change? And, and it, it's really interesting because that does change things quite dramatically. You, you build a lot more of it and you use a lot more electricity across the board. But it, it, it's really good to be able to tease out these kind of findings with this new analysis we're doing this year. Of course, once you've looked at these two variants, you also need to understand, well, what happens if you combine the best of both of those worlds? And so we're looking at that in what's called a tailwind scenario overall. And, I, and actually, though we think this looks quite stretching, uh, uh, both in terms of behavior change, technology deployment, and uh, things like cost reduction and efficiency improvement, this is quite an exciting scenario because this scenario does see the UK get to net zero ahead of 2050. Um, it gets to, gets to net zero in the, in the 2040s, actually, in the early in the early 2040s. Um, but cru crucially, this is not a recommended pathway because we, we don't have as much confidence on the high high rates of, of what you need to believe might happen in this scenario as, as we do in some of the others. So what we, what we what we do is we look across all of these pathways uh, and we determine a fifth scenario, which is what we call our balance. Net, z net zero pathway or a balanced six carbon budget pathway. And that's the focus of our recommendations that un underlies our budget recommendations. Um, and it's also the focus of what we're going to talk about today as well. So mo moving on then to what our recommended pathway actually looks like. And you'll see it um, on this slide compared to the UK's existing carbon budget. Um, and compared to the new carbon budget we're proposing, which is the sixth carbon budget, and, that, and that's the 2033 to 2037 period there, we, we've got historical emissions on the black line on this slide, and we've got our balanced pathway in the purple line overall. And just, just a few things I want to pull out for you on this slide. But first of all, some of you might remember, but as early as two years ago, we were actually aiming for an 80% emissions reduction by 2050. Now we're actually aiming for a, a, an 80% reduction in emissions by 2035, which is a dramatic change overall. And, and that's really why we think this is the most important carbon budget on the pathway to net zero. Uh, and we do think that this is the right pathway and how to get there. It, it's not actually a straight line between now and, and uh, 2050, which is, is reassuring for many reasons. First of all, um, because we spent about 18 months doing this work, so it'd be quite disappointing if it was just a straight line because it, it um, it might suggest that we didn't need to do all this detailed work, but more importantly, it's uh, it's got a it's got a lot of good reasons behind that the shape of this pathway, which we can which we can go into during this presentation. But but just to touch on it now, you you'll see if if you really focus in on the detail, the pathway doesn't actually start reducing emissions that that significantly uh, in the early years, and that's because we're we're starting from quite a low base for, from a lot of things in the UK at the moment. We don't, we don't sell many electric vehicles. We've only got only about 3% of new vehicles sold are, are battery electric vehicles at the moment. We don't install many things like heat pumps where we only uh, install about 20,000 a year. Both of those things we think need to get to the million plus scale mark in the 2020s. Um, and that, un that underpins the logic of this whole curve really in that we're scaling up from a low base now you build that scale over the 2020s, taking in, into consideration real real world supply chain, chain constraints. But once you get that scale and you start rolling that through the stock, then you see really dramatic emission re reductions starting in, 
something that happened in the 2030s. So you start to see the, 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 the line start to kink there. And there you get those dramatic emissions reductions, which really enable us to reach that budget level overall. Just the last thing to point out on this slide, we're also recommending that the, the, the government a, adopts uh, our, our new pathway as a re recommended uh, national de nationally determined contribution as, uh, for the UK under the Paris Agreement. We used to be under the EU's nationally determined contribution. So for the first time, the UK is able to put forward uh, their own contribution. And, and we think this really is a world leading contribution overall. And, and that's a contribution of 68% 68, 68 reduction in emissions by, by 2030. We've talked a little bit already about um, why the, why the path um, why the path is the shape it is, but importantly, it is slightly front loaded. Um, there's more action over the next 15 years than there is over the 15 years between 2035 to 2050. But but the action over the next 15 years isn't actually that that um, dramatic compared to what we've been doing over the last few years. Over the last few years, we've been reducing emissions on average be by between around 16 to 19 million tons of CO2 per year. And what, what we're talking about over the next 15 years is 20 to 21 megatons of uh, emissions reduction per year um, up until 2035. So not that dramatic, but there is an important difference there in that the emissions reductions we've seen in recent years have largely been down to closing coal in, in electricity generation, switching that to renewables and to some extent gas generation as well. But we were almost at the end of that road and we can't, we, we can't gain these slightly easier emissions reductions uh, any more over the next 15 years. So you've got to start doing the more difficult things. You've really got to take uh, transport emissions seriously, and, you, and you've really got to get going on decarbonizing uh, heat in buildings, as well as all the other sectors in the economy as well. Just looking at a bit more detail then on uh, how this does compare to global pathways. These charts show um, tons per capita per year for the UK um, in in the purple line of our pathway. Um, and for uh, for the global average, depending on whether we think the world is aiming for a two degree scenario or a one and a half de degree scenario, and that's the orange and green ranges and lines respectively. Um, and the, just to be clear, the chart on the left shows all greenhouse gas emissions, which is the basis for the UK's targets, and the chart on the right shows just CO2 emissions. But just a, a couple of things to draw out here. You'll, You'll see, and you won't be surprised at all, I'm sure, to, to note that the UK has historically had much higher emissions per capita than the global average. We know that. And, and actually, we've reduced those quite a lot to the point where we're, we're pretty much in line with the global average now at the moment. We're, we're ever so slightly higher. But then looking to the future, what we see is actually the world is on this really ambitious transition to net zero overall, um, as is the UK. But even with all this ambition in our pathway, the UK is not doing as much as the rest of the world in the early years of, of, this, of this transition between now and 2050. And, and that's because of that low starting point that, that, we're, uh, that I was talking about before. But it's also because the UK has done a lot of the easy stuff, which the world can do. And, and the two big things that the world can do over the next 10 years um, to really get that, these deep emissions reductions are stopping coal generation, and ending deforestation. Those two things no longer apply in the UK, um, but if the world stops doing them, that's, ha that's how we get to these really ambitious one and a half and two degree pathways for the world. And then you'll note that once we get to um, translating all of these low carbon sales through the stock in the UK, then you start to see these really deep em emissions reductions in the 2030s and onwards, which puts the UK um, net zero ahead of the, rest of the rest of the world, which we do think is right for a uh, proportionally more wealthy developed country like the UK with some historical climate liability as well for reasons outlined in detail in last year's net zero report. So moving on to, to looking at how you actually deliver this then overall, this is where you, this chart shows where you actually get the emissions reductions in our scenarios. And we tried to categorize it by what we're calling types of abatement, emissions abatement. So first of all, you could, you could just re reduce demand for carbon intensive activities. Um, that, that can be things like uh, reduced flying, uh, improved diet change, reduced driving, things like that. Then you can improve e efficiency use of energy and resources. Um, that can, can be things like the circular economy in industry, um, or it could be en energy efficiency in, in the UK's buildings and things like that. 
then what's then what's really important is uh, electrification, and you and you see that's the single biggest chunk on all of this. We we think there's massive scope for the UK to electrify, particularly in the um, electrifying the UK's vehicles and it, uh, electrifying the UK's buildings using heat pumps as well. And that's where you see a really massive chunk of these emissions reductions. But electrification doesn't do it all. Hy hydrogen is also really important, and and you'll see that play play a role in the, both the orange. Um, orangey red chunk here and and the light blue chunk as well um, and that's alongside carbon capture and storage as well and and these technologies are really critically important for things like heavy industry where we think uh, in particular hydrogen uh, allows industry to get to really low emissions by 20, by 2050 um, but you, you it wouldn't do all of industry by itself you'd need some electrification some carbon capture and storage alongside that as well hydrogen also very important in uh, shipping Uses uses ammonia potentially in heavy goods vehicles and to some extent very useful in buildings and power generation as well. And then lastly, to get to that net part of zero, you do need some level of offsets as well, some some level of um, emissions removals, and we and we get that from a few different things. We we've got nature based offsets uh, that increase tree planting and increase peatland restoration, and then we've got engineered greenhouse gas removals. That's bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, and and that's to some extent, direct air capture of carbon and sequestering that carbon uh, over long term as well. But we're not overly reliant on that technology. So, so that gives you hopefully a broader understanding of, of some of these emissions reductions. Another angle that we want to look at it from, though, is the level of behavior change. I've, I've mentioned that uh, the UK's historical progress in re reducing emissions to date, but actually all of that's been done without without really any difference that's been visible to yourself or I. Uh, and, and that's because when I turn on the light, I don't I don't I don't really notice the fact that we're not we're not burning coal to produce electricity. We've got more renewables on the system. And also I I don't see what happens with my waste, which is another really good area where we've reduced emissions in the UK, because I, I thankfully am able to just leave it at my doorstep and, and somebody comes and picks picks it up. That's not going to be the case for the next 30 years of emissions reductions in the UK. Uh, where we think actually people have a much, much, much bigger role to play in the, in the transition. And because of that, people need to be engaged in this transition as well. And we, we've tried to split up those emissions reductions you saw on the previous slide in, into actions which people might need to take as well. And what we're saying here is that at least 40% of those actions are from people, uptake, uh, people taking up new technologies. That's things like electric vehicles, that's things like heat pumps. It, these technologies um, do offer a similar level of service overall, but they are different to people's current technologies, which are obviously fossil fuel vehicles, and for most people, gas boilers. Then what we're separating out in, in the gold chunk here is what we're calling societal behavior change. Th these are slightly different category of choices where people might choose to eat more plant-based foods, for example, in, instead of uh, meat, and also may choose to fly less, those kind of things may choose to walk in, in or cycle instead of driving to to a, a destination which is quite close to their home. This gives this allows us to paint a much better picture overall of the importance of engaging people in, in this scenario. And and you probably won't be surprised to hear as well when we when we've looked at that variant that we're calling widespread engagement, these behavior changes are even even more important as well. So moving on then to, to look at some of the we, we've looked at the emissions reductions. Now we're looking at kind of the, the impacts and what's actually required to deliver these emissions reductions in, in terms of cost overall. So we, we've always said that uh, meet, meeting the UK's climate targets would cost in the order of 1% to 2% of GDP overall. Uh, but we're also very conscious that that number probably doesn't mean very much to many people whatsoever. So this year, we're trying to, to really break that down into something which hopefully is more tangible and more interesting to audiences like yourselves. And, and a part of that is actually we're splitting those costs into capital investment costs, but also operating cost savings as well. And that, that's what this chart is showing. And, and the first thing you'll see is this, is this is a massive scale up of capital investment that's required in the UK uh, between now and 2030. And then it's a case of maintaining that regular investment in all of these low carbon capital intensive goods between, that, between 2030 and 2050. And I, I guess this, this is, Fairly intuitive to me, but it, it uh, because a lot of these things are more capital intensive. 
For example, if you build renewables, almost all of the cost is in building these renewables, then they're free to run because the fuel is fuel is free. So you'd expect that to be more capital intensive than the alternative that we're looking at here. And just to be clear, all of these numbers are additional investment compared to a world uh, where we think there'd be high carbon investment instead. So what we're trying to classify here is what is the additional cost of doing the low carbon thing compared to the high carbon thing? The, the other bit of good, good news on, on this chart is that we do have low carbon investment in the UK to date. And a good chunk of that is in electricity generation. And, that, and that's what gets us to about the, t the 10 billion pound number that we've got, that we think we've got in the UK in 2020. That said, there is a massive scale up to be done over the 2020s. A lot of that is actually in electricity supply, but it's also in things like heat pumps, which are more capital intensive than gas boilers and electric vehicles, which we think have got higher upfront costs in the 2020s um, than fossil fueled vehicles do. We, I guess we, we were ever so slightly concerned about the plausibility of this, this scale up of finance. So we convened a group of expert financiers, uh, portfolio managers, asset managers uh, over the course of this year to sense check these numbers and really give, it, give us a sense of whether this is deliverable or not. Uh, and their simple conclusion was that, yes, it is deliverable, actually. Um, but it, the, the clear ask is for the government to bring forward the same kind of policy that has led to us having this additional low carbon investment in the UK to date in electricity generation. So if the, U if the UK government's able to recreate those kind of policy packages that it has for electricity generation, for buildings heating and for manufacturing construction and for transport um, and all other sectors of the economy, that's how you bring forward this private sector investment. We're not saying this is what the government needs to spend. We're just saying this is what the private sector needs to deliver. And here's how government can do it. The other bit of good news is that when, when we look at the cost savings, the operating cost savings from basically burning less fossil fuel in the UK, these are also really material overall. They start to become quite material by around 2030. Um, and they, by 2050, they actually offset the total investment cost that we see on this chart. And the, the biggest driver of that overall is actually driving. That's, uh, we, we think once you switch to electric vehicles, they're much more efficient than fossil, fossil fuel vehicles. And you can save a lot of money it, for, by building renewables instead of burning that fuel instead. To, get, to give you a sense of that, the, the UK spends uh, today around 20 billion pounds a year just on buying petrol uh, to put into vehicles, petrol and diesel to put into vehicles. And that's before um, accounting for the tax, uh, the fuel duty that's, that's on that there. And as are all of these numbers that I'm presenting to you today. Overall, we think it'll be cheaper to drive electric vehicles. So though the, although there'll be some capital investment necessary, there'll be massive op, uh, operating cost savings, so, which can offset these investment costs overall. It, when, especially when they're combined with savings from burning um, gas in boilers and gas for electricity generation, which is the other chunks of operating cost savings you see here as well. So we think this is a really positive story. Importantly, though, these aren't quite the net costs of the transition overall because we haven't included the cost of finance of these investments on top of this. And these are a really material cost as well. Um, we didn't want to add it to this chart because it gets quite confusing. But the, and the, the other reason is the government can, to some extent, control that cost of finance as well. So really, this is a pitch to government to say, look, here's the investment program that your policy needs to deliver. The additional, the, the net cost of this could be close to zero overall, but the additional cost, importantly, is something that you can control by delivering good, clear, real policy that enables the cost of borrowing to be low for this entire period to deliver these investments from the private sector at lowest overall cost. When we, when we do include these borrowing costs, we aggregate it up into these what we call annualized resource costs of GDP. So we group the, the capital costs, the operating costs, and the finance costs together to, to give us this overall sense of how it compares to GDP over time. Last year, we said uh, meeting the UK's net zero target by 2050 would be between 1% to 2% of GDP. I think specifically, it was around 1.2% of GDP. Um, and this year, we're looking at the shape of that profile over time. It, it does increase in line with the capital investment program, but then it, it broadly stays the same over, overall when taking into account all of these costs we've discussed already. 
I think the other good news story, which is is quite unsurprising actually, is that we're no longer talking about 1.2% of GDP. We, we're talking about 0.6% of GDP. And I don't think that's too surprising when we're looking at scenarios where you've got more behavior change compared to last year and you've got more technology cost reduction compared to last year as well. And then just to show that this is how the other pathways compare against our recommended pathway on the same basis. Um, actually, the most expensive pathway overall is the one where the UK achieves net zero ahead of 2050, which, which is quite an interesting conclusion for us. Just the, the last point on cost then, we, we want to get a sense of where these big uh, costs are per sector overall. And, and this just shows what they are in kind of billion pounds a year, um, but also as a percentage of GDP in 2030 and 2035. I, None of this is too surprising for us because this is pretty much the same chart as we had in last year's net zero report. But what we are highlighting is that we, we think surface transport can be cost saving compared to a high carbon alternative over the long term, as can electricity supply. And we're, but we are aware and we're not hiding the, the real material costs that are in, involved in decarbonizing some sectors of the economy. That's really apparent in residential buildings. And this is something that um, the Treasury's net zero review is really looking to in, in some detail. And it's also apparent in manufacturing construction um, and emissions removals as well. So, so just, just to flag where we see those costs materializing there. So then let, let's look at some of the uh, emissions, uh, sorry, energy changes we're likely to see over, over the balance pathway. First of all, it won't be surprising to you that fossil fuel use goes down quite dramatically between now and 2050. It's a fall in about 85% of oil consumption and about 70% for, nat for natural gas. Um, and the, the reason that is, is the only place you're really using oil overall by 2050 is in aviation. Um, and even there, we do recognize that you, you, there could be an alternative in that you use biofuels or synthetic aviation fuels instead. So oil, oil consumption could be even lower than this. Um, that, that we expect those fuels to, to be more, more expensive than, than using oil, of course. Um, and gas, we think we can drive out of the economy as well. We can drive it entirely out of the UK's building stock. And, and that's why that goes to zero, close to 2045, actually. Um, but we do think natural gas is still useful as an option to produce low carbon electricity combined with carbon capture and storage and low carbon hydrogen through methane reformation combined with carbon capture and storage as well. Um, we, we don't want to rule out that option, because if you do, then it just puts even more pressure on delivering low carbon electricity because you need renewables to pick up the slack to produce both electricity and hydrogen there, which we think already, already looks stretching for the amount of electricity in our scenarios. Looking at the amount of electricity, we, we think it probably needs to more than double between now and 2050. And, and this is similar to what we've said, we've said last year. And, and that's because of the electrification we've talked about in uh, the UK's vehicles, the UK's heat, heating stock, but also because in this, these scenarios, you're using quite a lot of that electricity to produce low carbon fuels, such as hydrogen and ammonia for shipping as well. Um, and that, that leads to a, um, additional demand for low carbon electricity overall. We're also producing a lot more low carbon hydrogen in these scenarios. 200 terawatt hours is not, by 2050, is not too far off the amount of electricity the UK totally produces today. So to give you a sense of the size of a system that we need for hydrogen, this really is something at, at material scale here, and we think you need to get going on this overall. We've mentioned some of the important sectors where that's used, but particularly useful in shipping, particularly useful in heavy industry, um, but, but also plays a role in power generation and to some extent buildings and heavy goods vehicles as well. Looking at bioenergy and waste use, we, we don't have a massive increase in bioenergy use uh, between now and 2050. Um, but what we do have is a more sophisticated and better use of bioenergy and waste uh, during, the, during the transition compared to today. And what, what we're doing there is, is just saying, how do you get the most bang for your buck in terms of emissions reductions through the, bio, the biogenic content of these fuels? And the answer for us is clearly you combine it with carbon capture and storage and you capture those emissions and sequester them over long periods of time. And that actually gives you negative emissions and also allows you to produce low carbon fuels such as electricity, hydrogen, and bi biofuels in line with, with carbon capture and storage facilities as well. The, the other thing we're including is the UK has got a growing fleet of energy from waste plants uh, to produce electricity. But actually, when, when you look at the carbon content of that electricity by 2050, it's really high carbon compared to some of the other stuff we're doing across the economy. 
so what you need to do is again add carbon capture and storage to, the, to those facilities to capture those emissions of that. And then looking at carbon capture in the round then, we, we, we think it's absolutely essential to meet the net zero target um, and all of our scenarios rely on it. There are some scenarios where we've got less use of carbon capture and storage overall, particularly the widespread engagement scenario. Where we're trying to recognize a preference from people for less engineered emissions removals and more nature-based removals. But we do think it's still critical for engineered greenhouse gas removal. And we don't see a world yet in the UK where you can meet a net zero target without this, without using carbon capture and storage to, uh, to offset some, some of the residual emissions we still expect to have in 2050. Um, it's also essential for some parts of manufacturing and construction as well. For, um, and like I, like I said, energy from waste too. Other, other parts of, of energy production, it's more of an option, as, as, I, as I described previously. So you might see less carbon capture and storage overall if, if we go even better on renewables, but it's still in, included as, as a core cost-effective option in, in our scenarios. And then just looking at the UK's land use, we, we do have big changes in the UK's land use. We, we've got uh, less meat and, and dairy consumption overall, which has a knock-on impact on the UK's land. We've also got improved crop yields. And we've got a really extensive tree planting program as well, in, in increasing from around 13,000 hectares a year today um, to between 35,000 and 70,000 hectares a year by 2050 in some of the more ambitious scenarios we've got. Um, overall, this does actually release some land uh, uh, overall in the UK. So although you're planting a, a lot more trees, you're actually reducing the, uh, the footprint of, the, of UK agriculture overall. Um, and so you, you do free up some land, uh, which could be could be used for other uses, and that, that's shown on the right hand side of this chart here. So that's what we've talked to so, so far is everything that uh, needs to happen. I guess what we want to move on to now is well, how do you actually make that happen, and, and what does government need to do? So let's look at some of the policy and, and priorities that we're outlining in, in our report as well. First of all, we're really we're really strong this year on kind of the cross-cutting policies and priorities. We've talked a lot about what needs to happen in individual sectors, but we think net net zero is so material that the government needs to recognise this in the round and and needs to really bring this into all all of its comprehensive long-term planning. First of all, fairness is is going to be a key issue overall. We, we've already seen in in the, the last decades that um, the, the UK's energy transitions to date have not been fair. Yeah, if, if you look at what's happened with coal mining uh, over, over previous decades, if you look at what's happened with energy bills and low carbon policy costs over the last decade, a, a, lot, of, a lot of these have um, led to increased inequalities overall. And, and it's really important that we, we don't exacerbate that in this transition. And actually, we, it's an opportunity to fix some of those inequalities and get them right. We, we recognize we're not the experts on that, but we would expect the Treasury's net zero review to have a deep look at this and come forward with some of the answers on how you pay for some of this stuff and how you dis distribute the benefits fairly as well. There are real material benefits in, in terms of not just emissions reduction, um, but in some areas, cost savings, uh, but also health uh, overall as well. We've talked about public engagement and we're clear that a public engagement strategy does need to come forward to bring people into this transition. Um, we need, we need to recognize as well that um, places and regions are important uh, in this transition. And there will be different different transitions going on within the UK over this period. We already recognize that, our, that in our advice where we provide different advice to the government of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, but increasingly, we'll need to look even more local than that and, and understand the implications for this transition for different areas of the UK. We've also talked about investment and the need to set a clear direction there. That, that, that's a really material one that the government needs to build into all policy. And I think it's something that the UK government prides itself on over, overall um, as being a stable place for investment in the world. Go government needs to be organized for this delivery challenge as well. I think some, some commentators out there, such as the National Audit Office or the Institute for Government, suggest things. Um, the government does need to reorganize itself in order to address this delivery challenge. We're not the experts on that either. We're happy to obviously see other people comment on that. But what's important for us is that the government takes this challenge seriously. And we are seeing evidence of that already. We've had the Prime Minister's 10-point plan, which gets us a really good step along the way to getting there. 
Um, and we've also got two new cabinet committees on climate change as well, which, which start to kind of centralize some of this decision making and give it the prominence that it deserves. Importantly, all, all of this can no longer be led by just the Department of Environment and the Department of Energy. This needs to be integrated into all government departments. And also the UK needs to look at subnational delivery actors as well, including local authorities, and integrate them into the, the delivery program here as well. A lot of this we'd expect to see come forward in the government's net zero strategy um, for next year. And, and the next two slides will cover some of the other things we want, we want to see in this strategy as well. And, and then lastly, we, we're very much aware that everything we're covering here is on domestic emissions in the UK, but we do recognize that consumption emissions are really, really important. We're, if, you, if you look at today's emissions in the UK, you probably add about 50% to that if, you, if you're adding the UK's consumption footprint as well. But importantly, we do expect these consumption emissions to, to go down over time too. We think they can reduce in the order of 60 to 70% 70, 70 by 2050. And also the UK can play a role in, in making sure those consumption emissions are reduced as well through things like product standards or even things like border and carbon, carbon adjustments as well to encourage uh, imports of low carbon stuff to, to the UK there. So definitely not shying away from that issue. A key thing that we've built into our analysis this year is um, the, the need to phase out high carbon, uh, carbon intensive activities and switch to low carbon activities on this transition to 2050 as well. And what we're trying to do is recognize the good work that's been done on the coal transition in the UK so far, and also rec recognizing that this is a good policy option for electric vehicles as well, and the government's embracing that and setting, setting a long-term target for phasing out the high carbon thing in favor of the low carbon thing. And, and actually, in, industry bodies are, are also really keen on that. You've seen bodies like the CBI and Energy UK come forward and say, look, we, we just want stable direction no matter what it is. If, even if it affects our business businesses in a material way, as long as we know the direction of travel, we, we can adjust. And that's what we're trying to, trying to recognize in these proposals here. So we're putting forward a series of clear dates, which we're asking the government to embrace, um, to say, by this date, you'll no longer be able to buy the high carbon thing, um, which means you'd, you'd, manufacturers need to bring forward a, the low carbon substitute. And by 2050 at the latest, you won't be able to um, use the, the high carbon thing entirely. And that's how you meet the 2050 target. So we're looking at that particularly for um, boilers in residential homes. Uh, also for electricity generation, where we think actually by 2035, you can completely stop stop the burning of unabated natural gas for electricity generation and switch to renewables um, other electricity options including gas with ccs and hydrogen power as well um, and and also things like stopping biodegradable waste being sent to landfill um, and putting ccs on energy from waste as well we, we think if the government brings forward some, some clear instructions on all of this then, then industry can clearly adapt. And, and we're trying to embrace that message with what we're putting forward here. Just lastly on policy then, um, this is what's on the government's to-do list over the next year, which is um, an eye-watering to-do list, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll all agree. But importantly, I didn't write this. The, the government wrote the vast majority of this. Now, I, I've added, I have to admit, I've added a few things to it, but this is what the government says it is working on at the moment in advance of COP26. And if you look at the detail in there, it's really pleasing to see strategies and delivery plans, which, which look across all sectors of, of the UK economy here. Th this is amazing progress. And this really does show that the government's taking the net zero challenge seriously. It, it's, also, it, it's also a really important marker of what needs to be done. We need to get all of these strategies sorted uh, by the end of next year. But then it's a case of swift and effective implementation of all of these strategies as well, so we can start the scale up and visit in our scenarios. A, a lot of these things we think we need to be in place before the mid 2020s, so things like business models for carbon capture and storage, for low carbon hydrogen production, things, things like that, so that we can scale up the low carbon activities in, in our scenarios. And, and so that's really the challenge here. Great that the government's recognizing that, but this really is the starting point of what we think is a decade of, of delivery for the low carbon transition.
just uh, looking at impacts of, on society then. So we, we have looked a bit more in the round this time at, at what we think this, this might imply for changes to UK society. Obviously, we've, we've talked about the investment challenge, but typically investment, especially um, in times of things like a post-COVID recovery, uh, can provide a boost to, G to UK GDP and a boost to jobs as well. So we, we recognize that we've, put, we've produced some macroeconomic modeling, which looks at that as well and suggests that this can lead to an overall increase in UK jobs and GDP. This is obviously different to the cost message where, where we're saying the, the resource costs. So, so just looking at a select cut of these costs do look like a cost compared to the high carbon activity. What we're trying to do with this modeling is say, actually, let's look at it more holistically. What, what does it look like when you consider industrial opportunities, when you consider the fact that um, there might be more unemployment in, in, in recent years, uh, and the fact that investment typically leads to a boost to GDP. When you take all of those things into account, um, it does lead to, we think it can lead to a, a an increase in GDP and an increase in jobs as well. We, we're also highlighting a few particular areas where, where we think um, it, it can increase jobs. And what we're looking at here is a, is a transition to um, low carbon heat and energy efficient buildings between now and 2050. And this, this is particular um, analysis done by, the, by an industry body called the CITB, which, which looks um, at the type of insulations and type of jobs you might have around these insulations for heat pumps, energy efficiency, things like that. And, and this does suggest an ad additional jobs um, in, in the 2020s alongside a transition to low carbon heating. Im importantly, these are also jobs that you need all over the country as well. These aren't just jobs in London or a particular area of the UK. The, the UK's building stock is obviously across the entirety of the UK. So these are local jobs. And I think that's a really important dimension here. We also do recognize that actually there are industrial opportunities associated with, with some of this stuff as well. Um, and actually, to some extent, there might be some first mover ad advantage to the UK in, in going fast on some of these options, uh, particularly in terms of um, reforms to the finance industry low carbon hydrogen, to some extent electric vehicle supply, and, and potentially uh, carbon capture and storage, including greenhouse gas removals. So we are, we are looking at some of the co-benefits and co-impacts of the scenarios as well. We, we typically don't quantify these, but we do want to take a broader lens than just looking at the overall cost. So it's, what, what we are looking at here is things like more active travel for, for, for people. So in, instead of people driving, we've got up to a third of trips, particularly in cities, being switched to walking or cycling instead. Um, and all that combined with healthier eating and a switch to electric vehicles leads to kind of cleaner air, healthier diet. And that's, that's a real material actually reduced burden on the NHS in the long term as well. We, we, haven't, we haven't quantified what that means overall, but th this is, these are really material cost savings. Um, if, you, if you were to quantify them, you'd see a material change here as well. Um, we're also potentially talking about quieter streets, more comfortable homes, and more access to green space as well, including ur urban green space from some, some of the nature-based measures in our scenarios. We've also got some net biodiversity gains as well in terms of um, peatland restoration, more mixed woodland as well, um, and then Im improved air and water quality alongside that. And just very, very lastly then to wrap up, why do we think this is a fair and ambitious contribution to the Paris Agreement? And then what, what does that actually mean in, in terms of some of other key comparators as well? It, it does mean the UK actually going ahead of the rest of the world on a lot of these metrics. We've got, we're looking to have more low carbon um, electricity generation um, than other, other countries over, over this period. We're looking to have more electric vehicles. We're looking to have um, possibly more CCS per, per capita in the UK. But um, given how reliant global pathways are, um, on CCS, this, this isn't necessarily um, expected across the board. We are looking to have more low carbon hydrogen and more heat pumps though, um, and potentially a significant amount of engineered removals per, per capita as well, not necessarily by 2030, but over the long term. We, we think this is a good thing. We, we think this is all part of a package of the UK delivering this, this global ambition as ho host of COP26 next year. And we, and we think taken together, this really, this really is what the UK should be proposing as a, as a leading contribution to the Paris Agreement. We think the UK should adopt these targets as soon as possible.
We think it, it should um, legislate the fixed carbon budget as early as possible. And we think it should deliver on its, uh, its ambitions by scaling up policy programs and delivery programs across all these areas to make sure that we're seeing these changes by, by 2035. And we think this is, this is the right thing to do for the UK for a whole host of reasons. Um, and we, I certainly hope that um, I've been able to outline some of those reasons for you all today, this afternoon, and be happy to answer any, any questions on that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Mike. That was an excellent presentation, um, covering a, a huge number of bases, uh, a lot of food for thought there, and it, it's really brought what is a very substantial report to life and uh, provokes a lot of interesting uh, questions that we will we will uh, try and get through. There are, we won't have time for all of them, unfortunately, so I'll, I'll get on with those. Um, Great. Thanks, Rupert. Many thanks. First one. Um, by Finlay Asher, who is uh, uh, um, an aerospace engineer. The Climate Change Committee's budget relies quite heavily on as yet unproven technical solutions such as hydrogen and biofuels with carbon capture and negative emissions technology to store carbon. How comfortable with the CCC about use of these technologies and critically is going to pay for it? Will we tax fossil fuel companies or will a taxpayer pay the burden to clean up these emissions? Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So, so we do look into the, the technical feasibility of these technologies, and, we, and we've convinced ourselves enough that it is technically feasible to uh, to capture carbon from these kind of energy processes and store it safely under the North Sea for long long enough periods of time for this to be actual genuine negative emissions. But there is an onus on needing to demonstrate this actually works in the UK. We, th we think all the component parts are there, but we need to get started on it in the UK to know that we can do this scale of negative emissions in the long run as well. But we, we haven't seen a scenario which manages to achieve net zero in the UK without these negative emissions. So we, we do think we need to get going here. Obviously, you have negative emissions from things like trees uh, as well, but there's a natural limit on how much carbon they can suck up in the time period to 2050. So we need these engineered solutions too. Um, interestingly, yes, a, a proposal is that fossil fuel companies could could uh, pay for some of these themselves. Um, they, or you could have it in some kind of emissions trading scheme, for example. If, given that you need these engineered emissions removals in the long run to offset emissions from sectors where we don't, we don't think you can really reduce emissions, like aviation, for example, you could maybe see a world where airline operators purchase negative emissions to offset their, their residual emissions for airlines, for example, and just pass through the cost of those onto flights. We've done some estimates of that. We think that could add 50 to 100 pounds to a 500 pound return ticket to New York. So given that people there could probably afford to, to pay that to go to New York anyway, it's probably quite an equitable way of doing it as well. Thank you, Mike. Next question is from Ajith. Apukutan, Rolls-Royce Senior R&D Projects Manager. Are you the only team advising the government, or there, are there any other groups as well providing similar data to UK government? Uh, well, well, the great thing about working in the UK is that there are a lot of people doing this kind of thinking. We, we are the official government advisor, though. So with a report like this, the government do have to listen to us, and they do have to respond. We, we're recommending quite stringent decarbonisation targets for the UK for 2030, which they've already accepted, and for 2035 as well. Um, over the next few months, we'll see if they accept our 2035 numbers too, and we'd expect a response from them next summer. Thank you, Mike. Next question is from Jason Collins, Wood, Wood Principal Environmental Engineer. Uh, how realistic is it to include aviation shipping and exported emissions, overseas emissions from imports in the budget, when to, to date budgets have not included these? And these are the hardest areas to tackle and require international cooperation. And I'll group together with that last point on imported emissions. There have been a number of questions about that uh, because it's recognised that the UK has exported a lot of manufacture and part of our emissions reduction is due to that, and the question is, uh, to what extent is this um, taken into account? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll probably split that into two. I'll talk about the aviation shipping stuff first, and then what we call yeah. consumption emissions second. So a aviation shipping, yes, 
the the UK is one of the only countries who's, who's plausibly thinking about including aviation shipping in its targets at the moment. Uh, the government still hasn't accepted this for, for nearer term carbon targets, but we do recommend that they include it. And, and that's because we think net zero does have to be for all emissions that the UK um, can have some control over. And, and, that, and that includes uh, emissions from aviation shipping, which are currently measured by the amount of fuel sales um, for, for those um, transport vectors coming from the UK. But we, we think you can, for example, produce low carbon fuels for some of those things and start in the UK and also lead international negotiations to ensure a global transition to low carbon fuels for both of those areas. The UK is well placed, and it's the kind of thing the UK should be doing as a so-called world leader in, in climate, especially in the run-up to COP26 next year. So we're quite strong on the inclusion of those things in budgets. On consumption emissions, we, we haven't recommended that they're included in budgets uh, so far, um, but definitely something very important to track. We, we do track this in, in every report we do at the moment, and, and I've seen in a couple of the questions, it's rightly noted that so-called consumption emissions, so imported carbon to the UK in goods, essentially, uh, about an additional 50% of UK emissions on, on top of what we have today. Um, but importantly, they are reducing as well. It, it's not just the case that the UK is only decarbonized by offshoring its emissions. Um, we've decarbonized electric, electricity generation a fair bit, um, and we've decarbonized waste. But also, we've got the same contribution of the UK's manufacturing sector to the to the UK economy uh, uh, today as we did in 1990. It's just less of that in things like steel and some of it's in more high value manufacturing, things like satellites. And then just lastly on that, if you do look over time as well, we are reducing those consumption emissions. We've reduced domestic emissions by 30% over the last 10 years, but we've also reduced consumption emissions by 20% over the last 10 years. Because a lot of the trends we're seeing in the UK, energy efficiency, low, ca low carbon electricity, things like that, are happening internationally too. And we think that trend will continue in the future. So we'll continue to decarbonize consumption emissions at the same time. But, but also the UK could probably do more to address those by even things like carbon border adjustments or applying some, some kind of tariffs or product standards to goods at the border. Thank you, Mike. Next question is from Kerry Mashford of the National Energy Foundation. I'm surprised to see such a small contribution from improvement of energy efficiency of buildings, given that buildings in use are responsible for about 27% of UK emissions. What would be your response to that, Mike? Yeah, this is something we, we do look into in a lot of detail, Kerry. Um, we, we've done some detailed modeling on this this year, and we, we do recommend that about 15 million um, buildings, or at least 15 million buildings, are retrofitted for energy efficiency in the UK, but and that reduces overall space heating demand by between 10 and 15 uh, percent on on average uh, by 2050 from today. So it's quite a significant reduction there. But we think the remainder of it of the reduction needs to come from switching to low carbon heat. This is particularly for existing buildings. There's still going to be a lot of demand for energy. And, and actually, we think some of that energy can be fairly cheap as well, be it whether it's low carbon electricity or in some cases, low carbon hydrogen. Um, so as part of a package, we, we include low carbon heat and energy efficiency in, in all the buildings modeling we do. Thank you, Mike. There are a couple of questions here which I'm grouping together. Um, first one from David Shearer's Rail Media Editor much modal shift does the CCC envisage there will be from less friendly carbon mo modes to rail? And uh, another question from um, Sean Quinn of Highview Enterprises Limited, lead process development engineer. Uh, why is the pathway focusing on electrification of private transportation as opposed to electrification as well as improvements and expansion of public trans? Transit. So it's, a, it's the balance and focus between private transportation and, uh, and our public transit and rail. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point and, and something that maybe doesn't come across that well in, in terms of how we typically present this, but we do really look at the demand side as well. As, as well. And our scenarios include up to a third of all journeys, of all car journeys being switched to non-car modes of transport. So that's public transport. Uh, walking or cycling, um, and and that's a reduction in overall miles travelled for the UK of almost 20% by by 2050. So we we do think that's quite significant. Um, but 
basically one in three journeys being switched to these lower carbon modes of transport. Uh, aware that we don't we don't talk talk about it that much. Um, with within that, I'm afraid I don't remember the rail number off the top of my head, but that's obviously included in, in those modal shift figures. Thank you. Um, next question from Michael Hudson of Siemens. What is the confidence in behaviour change given the current resistance to the current emergency cycle lane program? Yeah, great, great question. Actually, I think behaviour change is something that we we have probably less less confidence and there's significantly more uncertainty around in, in these scenarios. It's something we've built in a lot more in our scenarios this year than than we have in the past, given the feedback that we've had on previous work we've done, where we've been quite conservative about the level of behaviour change. But I think the answer is. People just don't really know how much attitudes to a lot of these things might change in the future. Uh, if, you, if you look at Holland, for example, there have been really um, successful cycling programs there. Obviously, it hasn't been re recreated in the UK. Uh, there may be changing attitudes to flying at the moment. Uh, I, I'd say it's, it's probably too early to tell. And there's some evidence suggesting that there's a, a shift away from meat and dairy consumption towards lower carbon diets in, in the UK already. And we, we're proposing a, a slight expansion of that by, by 2050. But I think. Compared to a lot of the other things in our scenarios, this is an area of, of larger uncertainty. And I think it's probably an area where government policy needs to start testing the waters a little bit and, and probably tracking things a bit better as well to understand are people are people's behaviors changing and are there ways we can we can point those in a, in, in a more low carbon direction without forcing people to do things they don't necessarily want to do. Thank you, Mike. Next question is from Thomas Pixton of Mazda Motor Corporation. Building electric vehicles results in more greenhouse gases in the early years versus a fossil fuel vehicle, with the savings starting to come after three to five years of usage with green electricity. Has this been included in the calculations? So the embodied energy of electric vehicles is significant, isn't it? And to what extent has that been taken into account? Yeah, it, it, it certainly is. And it's something we take quite seriously with all the low carbon technologies in our scenarios as well. So, so we look at the the carbon saving over the life cycle, as as well as uh, just just within the UK, um, to to the extent that these emissions from building vehicles occur within the UK, it it is captured in our scenario, um, and actually we have almost all of the manufacturing sector in the UK decarbonized by 2050 as well. So the same kind of vehicle plants, which will be using higher carbon energy today, will be using low carbon energy to produce the same type of of goods, including vehicles, in the future. And to the extent that we're importing vehicles as well, um, obviously there'll be we're, we're expecting a global transition to low carbon manufacturing too. Um, so, so that would be taken into account there. Thank you, Mike. Well, unfortunately, we've got uh, only one time for only time for any we've got time for only one more question. Um, there's so, there are many more and a lot of good questions here. So um, yeah, we're running out of time. Uh, it's a place for everyone. Yeah, this one's um, uh, Alex from Alex Alliston, self-employed renewables and sustainability consultant. In the expansion of low carbon electricity generation, does your model also include the cost of developing effective in intraday and interseason storage? For instance, this last month with low wind resource and little sun, we've utterly depended on gas for the grid. Wind as a percentage of total demand has been between 0.8 and 10% for a large amount of the period. Do you have a view on what long-term storage technologies will feature, e.g. compressed gas, hydrogen, thermal storage, ammonia, et cetera? Yeah, we, we, we do. Uh, this is a really interesting research question, I think, particularly for the UK, where you've got so much seasonal demand for, for energy. Right? And we do a lot of detailed modeling to try and look into this. And, and, and the answer is that there's no real kind of single storage technology you want to rely on, but it's more of a mixture of things. So in, in our scenarios, uh, things like smart charging or electric vehicles to re to reduce their draw on the on the energy system at, at peak times, but also s smart use of things like electric heating, so that they're not always um, used at peak at peak periods. That gets you a lot a lot of the way there. But also you need things like battery storage, further interconnection, and and that gets you even further. What that doesn't get you is is that kind of seasonal depth that the the question was was addressing there. And I think there we do recognize that the value that natural gas provides to the system today and the fact that uh, that low carbon gas could do that in the future. So in our scenarios, we include things like low carbon hydrogen uh, in the same kind of seasonal role there, be it providing, say, buildings heat directly or uh, providing 
energy for electricity generation during those periods. Thank you, Mike. Well, that was a really good uh, question and answer session as well, following an excellent presentation. And, and many thanks again for your time in presenting. Uh, you, you, you covered such a lot, and I think it's given uh, all of us a lot to think about. And, and um, I hope we can continue the dialogue, certainly as ESG. Uh, we we bring together different sectors in uh, arrivement solutions, and would want to support you in in that, that your process, and and hopefully we'll we'll stay in touch on that front. And I encourage everyone to keep an eye on our monthly webinars, where we'll be picking up some of the themes that Mike has presented on today. So all together we can we can join in uh, meeting that 2050 target. So many thanks okay. again, Mike. And with that, I'll, I'll end the session. Goodbye, everyone, and uh, have a have a good Christmas when you get there.